Okay, uh, we're going to uh, pick up here chapter four. I think is where we uh, left off uh, last time. We uh, finished up, and uh, we obviously uh, talked about density there at the end of chapter two. Again, density is mass divided by volume. Uh, and that's D is equal to M over V. We could also rearrange this equation and solve for any of those things. Uh, volume would be mass divided by density and mass would be volume times density. Uh, you know, sort of three ways that we talked about sort of in that chapter of how you could get sort of the volume part of this. Uh, obviously you could just take a volume reading. Uh, you can do some length measurements of the width times the height times the uh, length there. Uh, get something like a cubic centimeter as your volume. And then the other common one that we talked about is that sort of volume by displacement, where if you do have a liquid in a container and put some type of solid object in it, it will displace a volume that's equal to its own volume. And you basically could take the difference there between the two volumes and the volume of the object uh, will equal the final volume minus the initial volume. So that's a very common way that we uh, can sort of determine the uh, volume of an object. Um, we then sort of moved on to chapter four and just briefly started our little talk here about the atom, uh, which again is the basic uh, unit of an element that could come into really chemical combination. Uh, the atom, as we talked about, and we'll continue to talk about here in just a bit, uh, is basically made up of smaller particles, which are subatomic particles. And those are like our protons, our electrons, and our neutrons. And we talked about a really important sort of concept in chemistry that was also really important uh, through some of these experiments that helped us understand what was going on with the atom. And it's sort of that opposites attract there. And uh, sometimes referred to as electrostatic attraction. And basically things with opposite charges are going to be basically attracted to one another. Uh, that also means that things with the same type of charge uh, will pretty much be held by each other. So again, uh, things that have similar charges will want to go opposite directions. And same thing if you have two negative ones. This is, as I might have mentioned last time, a really big sort of interaction uh, in chemistry. Lots of things, uh, especially like how molecules and other molecules interact with themselves and even how uh, one type of molecule interacts with itself uh, is all really based on this sort of basic principle of uh, positive and negatives being attracted to one another. It's why certain things are soluble or mixed together. It's also why certain things do not mix together. And this level of attraction is also responsible for things as we'll talk about in a later chapter. Uh, Things like boiling points, melting points, why certain ones are higher, why certain ones are lower, uh, this type of attraction. So this positive different parts of it, and it's a good thing to keep in mind. I think we might have also talked about that a lot of times in some of these experiments here. Uh, they did use sort of radioactive sort of particles, uh, which do have certain charges. Uh, three common sort of radioactive particles that are oftentimes reused in a lot of these sort of experiments uh, are things like alpha particles, uh, which are positively charged radioactive particles, uh, beta particles, which are negatively charged radioactive particles, and gamma rays, uh, which are basically just pure energy. Uh, they kind of have no charge. And the benefit of using something uh, that does have a charge and taking advantage of that opposites attract is it does allow you to sort of explore, uh, you know, what the charges of other things are. You know, if something goes through and 
as we might have talked about, you know, something just kind of goes through no problem, um, probably has no charge. So it's unaffected by anything that might be there. If you throw it through an electrical field, for example, and it does just go straight through, uh, it will definitely have no charge. If you shoot something and again, kind of curves upwards towards that positive charge plate, uh, you would know that that guy is most likely going to be negatively charged. And if you shoot something that sort of curves down towards the negative side of an electrical field, uh, you know that that beam is probably containing positive sort of particles. So uh, using these sort of particles that have charges uh, was very popular in a lot of experiments uh, that were performed. Any questions on that stuff there? I think that's about where we left off, if I'm not mistaken. All right, so we started talking about uh, the idea of the atom. And uh, <clears throat> one of the earliest sort of experiments uh, that helped us understand what was going on in terms of part of the atom uh, was J.J. Thompson and the cathode ray tube. And cathode ray tubes, which is sometimes abbreviated as the CRT uh, tube, um, was used to explore electrons. So this was used to look at electrons, really. And what the CRT is, is really a, it's a tube uh, that typically has a charged part on one end and a negative part on the other. And it's a beam of negatively charged particles, like electrons, which means that that beam of negatively charged particles would head towards the positive side there of uh, this sort of tube, if you will. Uh, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll put something at the end of the tube there that will fluoresce. So you can actually see the uh, sort of beam where it's hitting. Uh, you might uh, be familiar with uh, cathode ray tubes or maybe have seen them. If you have an older TV or have seen an older TV, not a plasma, anything like that. But uh, ones like these have on the floors and houses that have like big backs. You take off the back of the TV and stuff like that. Those are cathode ray tubes. They have picture tubes in it. You used to call the repairman to come fix your TV when it didn't work. You didn't just go get one brand new one or anything like that. Um, also, if you've ever seen an older computer monitor that also has kind of like a big sort of back to it, uh, they used to kind of look like this. Like a monitors like that with a big sort of back part of it. Uh, those are used CRT monitors as well. And uh, <clears throat> this obviously is up here. And Thompson's work with the cathode ray tube, along with another guy, uh, which is known as Milligan. Milligan did what is known as an oil drop experiment. And what he did is kind of what the name implies. He took a chamber that also had really an electrical field in it. And he shot in oil droplets into this chamber. And what would happen is the oil droplet would start to fall uh, and would pick up an actual charge as it's coming down. And what he was able to actually do uh, with this electrical field, thank you was he was able to adjust the electrical field in such a way that the oil droplets uh, pretty much would just hang there. So it wouldn't fall, it wouldn't go down or anything like that. So he was able to dial in the electrical field in such a way that just kind of suspended the oil droplet there. And these two experiments, the ones done by Thompson and the ones done by Milligan was really important in understanding a little bit about the electron. And what came out of Thompson's experiment was he was able to figure out what is referred to as the charge to mass of an electron. And what Milligan was able to really determine was the charge on an electron. So those two experiments are really important because uh, Thompson was able to get this charge to mass and Milligan was able to get the charge of an electron. And when you put both of those sort of experiments together, the mass of an electron was able to be determined by taking the charge that Milligan figured out and you divide it by the charge to mass of an electron. Those cancel and you get something like the mass of an electron 
That is something in this ballpark here, 909. Five cents at a minus 28 grams. Uh, that is a large number, small number? It's a small number, right? It's like 28 places to the left and 27 zeros, right? So very small type number. So these two experiments are really important for understanding uh, sort of the nature of an electron. And what came out of sort of these experiments was one of the first sort of models of what we thought the atom looked like, and it was referred to as the plum pudding model. And basically, this is a picture of it. And they basically thought at this point in time that, okay, we've sort of discovered electrons which are negatively charged. Uh, we kind of think that the atom is neutral. So we do know that the atom has to have some type of positive component in there uh, to basically balance out those negatively charged electrons. So this sort of first model of the atom came about with the idea from Thompson that I know the positive charge is all this spread out all over the sphere of the atom, basically. So really diffused and spread out over the entire uh, atom. And embedded inside the atom are these negatively charged electrons. And that's what a plum pudding is. It's a pudding with raisins. So he thought like the pudding was like the positive charge sort of spread out. The raisins sort of represents like the, how the electrons would be in there. So this was, again, sort of an early model of the atom that came out of this sort of early experiment where they were able to really kind of determine some information about electrons. They had this idea that it's a neutral atom. Uh, so that was sort of their explanation of you know, where the positive charge would be. Now, this was all good and dandy until really the next major sort of experiment came along that really sort of shook up the idea of the atom and how it is and how it's made up. And that was done by a guy named Rutherford, and he was known as the gold foil experiment. And what Rutherford did was he took out particles active particles and he shot pieces of gold foil and other metals and based on sort of the plum pudding model they were really expecting sort of one thing to occur but what actually occurred was something very different so when we take a look at this sort of model here let's erase that all so we and if we were going to shoot these alpha particles, which again are positively charged particles, at this basically sphere of positive charge all spread out, they expected that when they did shoot these things, these particles are heavy and they're moving pretty fast. They expected them to be able to pop through that sort of pudding of positive charge, but they did expect some deflection to occur. So if you think about if you took like a piece of paper, right, and you held it really tight and you shot a pen at it, right, you'll be able to probably pop through, right? But it would kind of deflect as it would sort of poke through the paper uh, out the other side. And that's kind of really what they sort of expected to happen uh, when they were doing the gold foil experiment. They were actually surprised when they did the gold foil experiment was that pretty much most of the alpha particles just kind of sailed through with no problem. So they just kind of went right through. They weren't deflected or anything like that. They just pretty much went straight. But what they did notice was every so often, uh, they would have an alpha particle that would scatter at a really large angle and even maybe come back to where it was shot at. So that was very surprising to them based on the plum pudding model where they would expect those alpha particles to go through the atom with deflection because the positive charge is spread out all over, right? So it should hit positive charge no matter where it went through. So they had to sort of revisit the atom that was thought of before. And that's what we see here. Here's like a source of alpha particles. This is like a detection screen. And for the most part, most of them just kind of went straight through. But again, every so often we would get these guys sort of scattering out at these sort of large angles. So let's think about what that means in terms of what they saw. If they had alpha particles that went straight through with no problem, uh, what did those things hit? 
probably nothing, right? So like if I took my pen and I didn't like throw it through my paper, right? But I just kind of threw it that way with nothing in the way, it's just gonna sell pretty straight, right? It's not gonna deflect or anything like that. I did notice that these alpha particles at some points would bounce off at these. These alpha particles that they're shooting are positively charged. What type of charge thing did it have to hit to make it bounce off at a really large angle? It had hit something that was really, really actually positive, right? Uh, because it would bounce off. It was If it was negative, it would be attracted, right? It would just kind of stop, right? And go, cool, I'm here. Uh, but in this case, it hit something that it does not want to be around. So it bounced off at these really large angles. Now, it had to be something that was very, very positively charged, right? Very densely positive to make those alpha particles, which are relatively heavy and moving pretty fast to bounce off at those really large angles. So the results of this was a little surprising based off of the plum pudding model. And they basically had to say, well, not so correct this model here. And they had to kind of come up with a new model of the atom and what they said was that most of the atom is empty space. And that's what accounts for those alpha particles that pretty much didn't have any problem. They just kind of sailed right through. They didn't really encounter anything. Uh, later on and stuff in that empty space is really where we have our electrons kind of moving around in that empty space. They also said that the atom had to contain a very dense positive core, uh, which is known as a nucleus. And that obviously accounted for why only certain times those particles were bouncing off at really large angles because they'd hit something very, very positive to make them bounce off. And as we will later find, Obviously, that is where our positively charged protons are. And in 1930 or so, that is where our neutrons, which have no charge, is found. So the other major difference between the plum pudding model and really the current model of the atom was in the plum pudding model, the previous model, they felt that most of the mass of the atom was actually made up of the electrons. So they felt that the electrons was actually most of the mass of the atom. But in reality, most of the mass of the atom is actually the nucleus. And this is really sort of our modern version of the atom. Uh, we have, again, this nucleus, which has our positively charged protons, protons and our neutrons in there. And out at some distance from the nucleus in that empty space, we have our electrons moving. And by the way, our electrons do not move in pretty circles around the nucleus, uh, which you might think of as how they move. They actually do not do that. Uh, we have protons and neutrons. Electrons actually move pretty random about the nucleus there. And as we'll talk a little bit about, there really is no good way of knowing for a particle like an electron at any given time exactly where it's at or exactly how it's moving. Uh, the more you know about its location, the less you know about how it's moving. And the more you know about how it's moving, the less you know about its location. That is everybody's favorite Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? So that is basically what that uh, talks about. So sometimes people are taught they're in these pretty orbits, which is the Bohr model, which uh, is not really correct. So uh, they actually do move around in a pretty random motion. We talk about electrons in the sense of there's a high probability of finding an electron in a particular location within an atom. We don't really know how it got there, where it is at any point in time, but we can make a pretty good guess of, you know, in this area of the atom, there should be a high probability of finding an electron uh, versus maybe further out in the atom. So with that being said, is there an attraction between the electron and the nucleus? Attraction between electrons and nucleus. Nucleus is overall what type of charge? 
It is positive, right? Electrons are. So should there be an attraction between those two? There is. And that's what keeps electrons from just, you know, flying away, basically, right? And they're, in the case of their location to the nucleus, there is an attraction because of that opposite attract. It is also the basis, as we'll talk about in some later chapters as well, why certain electrons, for example, are involved in bonding and others are not. Uh, there are certain electrons, which are known as core electrons, which are really close to the nucleus, and they're going to be held a lot tighter because they're closer to that positive charge than higher energy electrons, which are further away from the nucleus, which are referred to as valence electrons. They're further away. They're still held, but not held as tightly. And that's why they're able to sort of be involved in bonding and stuff like that. Why other ones are too close to the nucleus to really be involved in things like bonding. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so, uh, the nucleus, right, as I just mentioned, has protons. And it actually wasn't until about 1930s, a guy named Chadwick who kind of uh, discovered or officially discovered uh, neutrons existence uh, for a lot of years after sort of Rutherford and so forth, everybody really did believe that there was another sort of particle within the nucleus, uh, but it wasn't really until like the 1930s that uh, proof sort of came about with Chadwick's sort of uh, experiments. Chadwick did some experiments with uh, gamma rays and alpha particles and he noticed the things like gamma rays were coming off and again gamma rays have no charge and then he sort of discovered them and called them neutrons that have no charge so once again in the nucleus we have uh protons and neutrons flying random sort of movement in that empty space sometimes referred to as the electron cloud is where we have our electrons moving the nucleus is relatively small compared to really the size of the atom, even though the atom is relatively small. Um, so you can think of the atom like uh, the Superdome, big football stadium. Anybody ever been to the Superdome? Big. You sit in the seats and you still feel like you're going to fall over. <laughs> it's that big. Uh, but if you have a big football stadium, uh, that's like the atom, marble, like on the 50-yard line there. It's a nucleus. So where those electrons are moving around small little part of it is that dense positive core that also explains right why all those alpha particles took a long time to hit something right it's kind of small when it needed to hit the, the, and it's mostly empty space and that's that <clears throat> now when we talk about uh the proton the neutron and the electron there is a difference in the mass of those. So earlier I wrote on the board there, uh, the electron is roughly uh, 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus 28 grams in terms of its mass. Proton and the neutron are roughly like 1.67 times 10 to the minus 24 grams, give or take a digit. Usually when you see their digits, uh, they oftentimes will take it out to a lot more digits. And that is because out of those three, uh, particles that make up an atom, uh, the neutron's actually the heaviest of all three of those. The proton is very, very close. You have to go out about three decimal places for the difference. They're almost identical and they're massive. Uh, but if you go out a few extra decimal places, the neutron just edges out the proton in terms of the mass. It's actually the lightest of all three. So, just for relative comparison purposes, both the proton and the neutron is roughly about 1,800 times heavier than an electron. So they're both times heavier than any electron flying around. So that also sort of reinforces the idea that Rutherford had, which was, most of the mass of the atom is actually the nucleus because within the nucleus you have protons which are about 1800 times heavier than any electron you also have neutrons which is also about 1800 times heavier than any electron uh, so those two guys make up the nucleus so that also would make sense that it is most of the mass of the atom another sort of mass unit that is sometimes used in chemistry is what we see on this slide which is atomic mass unit amu um, it technically is uh, 
that number right there. Um, and an atomic mass unit is used occasionally. Um, and it is the mass is equal to 112 of the carbon 12 atom. Uh, the carbon 12 atom, which is an isotope of carbon, uh, was used as a standard to sort of figure out some of these things. But a proton will have a mass of about 1.007 AMU. Uh, you can see that a neutron is pretty much identical, but just if you go out a few decimal places there, just barely is heavier there than a proton. And you can see in comparison, much, much smaller mass unit there for our electron. So um, you do not need to know these exact numbers or anything like this for the protons, electrons, or neutrons, uh, but you do need to know that uh, neutrons are the heaviest, followed very closely by protons, and that the electrons are the lightest of the three. Yeah. Any questions on that there? So this is basically our model of the atom. Looks something like this. And again, our electrons traveling in a random motion. So you do need to know a little bit about those experiments that we talked about. Um, you do also need to know, obviously, uh, sort of the earlier model of the atom, the plum pudding model. And you need to know, obviously, the current model of the atom, which is this one here, mostly empty space, nucleus, protons, neutrons, and electrons flying about. You obviously need to know as well the location of each of those things, yes, and the charges on each of them. So electrons are minus one, uh, protons are plus one, and neutrons have no charge. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about these. Take a second. Which of the following fits each of these descriptions? Found outside the nucleus. What is outside the nucleus? Should be the electron. Sounds good. Uh, has a positive charges. Proton. I like it. Has uh, mass, but no charge. That's our neutron. Yeah, perfect. I agree. Right. True or false on each of these. So take a moment. All right, let's take a look. Uh, the mass of an electron is greater than the mass of a proton. That is false. Yep. Again, the electron is the lightest of those. Protons have positive charge. Electrons have negative. That was good. Nucleus of the atom contains protons and neutrons. That is true. There we go. I like it. Uh, this is sort of what I was uh, talking about earlier. Again, nucleus, very small compared to actually, actually the size of the overall atom but it actually is really the sort of mass center of the atom uh, where it has those protons and electrons. This is something that maybe you can kind of make out on that screen. This is oftentimes that empty space here. Um, and that's again, how we sort of refer to it or look at it as this is what it's sometimes referred to as an electron density map or probability sort of map. And in darker areas are higher probabilities of finding an electron. Uh, kind of lighter areas or lower probability of finding an electron. By the way, just in a lower probability area, does, area doesn't mean that you won't find an electron. It's just, again, a low probability that an electron might be there. Might be a little hard to see here. And as you sort of think, and again, that means this is sort of a lower probability of finding electrons in those particular locations. All right, so let's talk about some other aspects of atoms, uh, including atomic number, mass number, and isotopes. Good talk. Let's go back, maybe. There you go. So the chemistry of an atom does come from its electrons. Um, they're involved when atoms combine. So if you just think about the location of where electrons are, uh, they're on the outside, which means when two atoms come together, they're pretty much the first ones to say hello to each other, right? The electrons to electrons. Uh, and in certain cases, as we'll talk about, uh, that may result in electrons jumping ship from one place to the next. It may result in some type of electrons being shared between things, um, depending on sort of what elements are involved. Most all chemical reactions, as we might have talked about, only really involve electrons. And um, it has nothing to do with what happens in the nucleus. Uh, so protons, neutrons are not usually touched or changed as a result of a chemical reaction. It really is just making bonds and breaking bonds. 
and that's only involving electrons. So they're sort of important in in terms of. So let's talk about the first type of number, which is really important, and that is the atomic number. The atomic number is sometimes abbreviated with a Z. And the definition of the atomic number is the number of protons there are in the nucleus of an atom. Now, since protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged and neutrons have no charge, if I have a neutral atom, right? Neutral atom means it has no overall charge. And I know the number of protons which are positive. That would mean how many electrons should I have? Exact same number, right? So that would make it neutral, right? If you have the same number of protons, same number of electrons, you have no charge. Neutrons, which have no charge anyways, have no effect, obviously, on any type of charge, right? So the atomic number will also tell you if the atom is neutral, uh, the number of electrons that you should have. Now, it's a really important distinction here is if you are asked a question, which you might be along the way in your journeys, of uh, what is the definition of atomic number? The definition of atomic number is only the number of protons. So it is only the number of protons. Uh, second to that is if you're talking about a neutral atom, it will also tell you how many electrons, but that is not the definition of atomic number. It is only the number of protons. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Sometimes people remember the part about electrons and protons are the same in a neutral. So when they're asked, you know, what is the definition of atomic number? They say protons and electrons, and that is incorrect. So it has to be just the protons for the definition. So uh, when we go to the periodic table and we look at the symbol and we look at the number above the symbol, that's the atomic number. Yeah, so that right there is the atomic number. And if you look at the periodic table, or a periodic table, do any pop, do any of them repeat? They do not, which means two very important things. It means that if you know the atomic number, or you know the number of protons, which is essentially the same thing, and you have a periodic table, you should know exactly what element you're looking at. All you have to do is find that number. Um, that also means one really important thing, out of protons, electrons, and neutrons, which one then should be the most important in terms of what element you're dealing with? It is the protons, because every element has a unique number of protons. So it is actually the number of protons that determine what element you are dealing with. You will never find a boron atom with eight protons because the person that has eight protons is oxygen. Yeah, has atomic number eight. So boron should have five, right? So it should have five in that case. That is why, as you probably know or will know, law of conservation of mass, why we balance equations, why in a normal chemical reaction, if we start with six carbons, we will end with six carbons because it only involves electrons and bonds being made and broken. We don't touch anything in the nucleus, which means we never change the element as we start with to where we end in a chemical reaction. We only change where they're hooked up with, right? We change what partners they may be with, but the elements never ever change in a normal chemical reaction because we do nothing with the nucleus. Now, that is completely different in nuclear chemistry, which we don't talk about in this class anymore, but in nuclear chemistry, that's all you do. You change things in the nucleus. You change protons to neutrons, neutrons to protons, and that's why in nuclear chemistry, you don't have the conservation of elements as you do a reaction, but in chemical reactions, like we talk about in this class strictly, uh, you do have that because the only thing we play with are electrons and nothing in the nucleus, so that's a really important thing to sort of keep in mind. That's also why we see here for our friend nitrogen, it's got seven up there on top, which would be its atomic number, which means again, in a neutral nitrogen atom, it should have our seven protons, which are positive. It would then have a matching seven electrons, which gives it a zero overall charge. 
by the way, I know it has no charge because if it did, it would be actually be written right about there. So if you do not see anything written top right of the symbol, you could assume that it is neutral. If you're given stuff in words and it doesn't mention anything about a charge, you could safely assume that the thing's probably neutral. So if it has a charge, it definitely will be made known to you. And we'll talk about what, what you need to do in that situation in just a bit. Another really important number is actually the mass number. The mass number is abbreviated with an A is the number of and proton uh, present in the nucleus of an atom. So the mass number and the atomic number are really important because the mass number is our number of protons plus our number of neutrons. Our atomic number is the number of protons, which means if you take both of those numbers and you subtract, number of protons cancel, and that is how you can determine the number of neutrons that somebody has. So you could take their mass number minus the atomic number, and that'll give you the number of neutrons there are. Every element has protons, electrons, and neutrons, except for our friend hydrogen it has a lot of special properties. <laughs> hydrogen actually does not have a neutron. So hydrogen has one proton and one electron, no neutrons. Uh, everybody else has all three uh, of those particles in there. When you calculate something like the mass number, the atomic number, the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons, they all should be positive whole numbers. And that's really important to keep in mind. So now we, we come back to our favorite thing, the periodic table here. And we see some other numbers happening. So we know this is the atomic number. Is that the mass number? The answer is no, it is not the mass number. Yeah. That is, as we will talk about shortly, what is known as the atomic mass, which is not the mass number. So that is the atomic mass. How do I know that is not the uh, mass number? When I calculate the mass number, atomic number, the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons, it should be what type of number? It should be whole numbers. If you look at all these numbers here, pretty much none of them are whole numbers. Yeah, they're all decimals. That's a really good way to remember that. Don't be the person that writes that number on an exam or quiz as the mass number it happens a lot. The reason it happens a lot is because a lot of times the mass number and the number you see here are very close in terms of numbers. So sometimes people think, oh, that, that may be just rounded or something, you know, that number that's on the periodic table. So maybe that's what's going on there. And that's really what's not going on there. So we'll talk about shortly how we get to this number and they are very close in sort of values sometimes, and it's because they're based on the mass neutrons that are present, but they are not the mass numbers. So you will be given enough information in those type of problems to be able to calculate the mass number, uh, to calculate the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons, and that is how you should calculate it. The only number that you should get off the periodic table is the atomic number and no other number. Any questions on that there? So that is a very, very, I'll say very two more times, very, very common mistake that people make uh, when they're trying to do mass numbers is they start writing this number or they go, the favorite questions, they come up and go, uh, should I uh, just use the rounded number here for mass number or stuff like that? And I'm going to tell you, you should use the definition of mass number. So that is calculated properly, which is not that number. All right. So let's talk a little bit about isotopes. Uh, isotopes are the same element, uh, but they have different masses. And if you remember, I think we talked about Dalton and his atomic theory the other day. And uh, this is one of the things that were so incorrect in Dalton's atomic theory. Uh, he said that all atoms of the same element are identical to each other, and the existence of isotopes disproves that. So isotopes are the same element, uh, but has different masses. So which thing, again, makes it the same element? It has to be the number of protons, right? So uh, isotopes all have the same number of protons because they're the same element. 
uh, but they have different numbers of neutrons and that's what gives them their mass difference. So uh, they'll have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. And that is again, what makes it an isotope. Uh, so for example, hydrogen has one proton and no neutrons. Deuterium, which is sometimes referred to as heavy hydrogen, has uh, one proton and one neutron. Tritium, which is like the radioactive version of hydrogen, has one proton and two neutrons. One way that we commonly will write isotopes is to show the mass number and the atomic number. So we oftentimes will use the symbol like we see here, or the generic symbol. Top left will be the mass number. Bottom left will be the atomic number. So for example, if we were going to do this for each of these isotopes of hydrogen, and maybe it doesn't even scream hydrogen to you, deuterium or tritium, we could think about how we could do this. So if we just knew it had one proton, we should go to the periodic table because we know that our atomic number is going to be one, right? And we would find the one that has one on it. And if you didn't know what the symbol was for hydrogen, that would be the symbol that you would want to use. So we would write our symbol for hydrogen. The atomic number, which is one, should go on the bottom left. We would then find our mass number by adding, right, the protons and the neutrons together, which would give us one plus zero is one, which means our mass number there for hydrogen would be one that goes up on top. And that would be the proper symbol for hydrogen with the mass number on the top left there and the atomic number there on the bottom left. Now, if we go to deuterium, which once again, might not scream hydrogen to you, but once you see that it has one proton, I'm going back to my periodic table and finding number one, which is still hydrogen. So we would still use hydrogen as the symbol because even though it has a different name, it is still really hydrogen because it has one proton. Atomic number there would be one on the bottom left. We would add our protons and neutrons together in this case, which would give us two. And that would be our mass number that would go up here. This would be the symbol there for deuterium. Tritium, once again, doesn't also scream hydrogen at people sometimes, but the one proton should. So again, to the periodic table, we find number one, still the same symbol because it is still the same element in all three of these guys. Still has the same atomic number of one, but in this case here, one plus two is three. And that would be our mass number to find the number of neutrons if you have the symbol given to you. You take the top number minus the bottom number, right? One minus one is zero. Two minus one is one. Three minus one is two, right? So top number minus the bottom number, if you have the symbol sort of written for you, will give you the number of neutrons. Question on that. Now, another very common way that isotopes are written is something like this, for example, Cu64. What does that number represent? Well, if I'm not sure, I know that's copper, right? So I should go to the periodic table and find Cu, which should be right about there-ish, over there. And right there, it is 29 up on top. And that 29 means what number is 29? That is the atomic number, which means that this number cannot be the atomic number, right? So it probably is which number? It is the mass number, yeah? So this is a very common way as well that sometimes isotopes are written uh, with kind of the symbol dash the mass number. And it's red copper 64, for example, is how it's read. So if I wanted to convert this into... The other notation on the bottom left should go 29, right? Which is our atomic number. Up on top should go 64, which is our mass number. And now you're going to tell me in this case, the number of protons is how many? It is 29. Number of electrons in this case would be? Would be 29 as these are positive, these are negative, zero, nothing written here. So again, we could assume that it is neutral. Number of neutrons in this case would be? I'll trust you. So let's see what you get. We got 64 minus 29. Sounds about right. 35 there. I hope you have any questions on that one there. <clears throat>
All right. Fun with chemistry. Here we go. All right. So why don't you try some here? So for each of these, figure out how many protons. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so once again, when it's written like this, uh, that is our mass number up on top. Uh, that is our atomic number there on the bottom. And uh, that means a good place to start would probably be our atomic number, right? Because that's going to straight up tell me our number of protons in this case would be 27 positive guys. I see nothing written here, right, which tells me it is neutral. So that then should tell me the number of electrons should be how many? 27 as well. Once again, all 27 positive and negative charges cancel each other out and give you no charge overall. Number of neutrons, once again, going to be our mass number minus our atomic number, which is basically top number minus bottom number here. Uh, so that's a 60 minus 27, uh, 33 in that case. Yeah. Any questions on that one there? All right. Rolling to uh, CO, by the way, is cobalt. CL is chlorine. Um, so again, I'm going to start with the atomic number there, which is 17. Uh, so that will tell me my number of protons in this case should be 17. Once again, nothing written there. So I know it is neutral. Uh, so we should, again, have an equal number of negatively charged electrons to get us to no charge. Uh, number of neutrons here, once again, again take our top number uh, minus our bottom, which is our mass number minus our atomic number. And it looks like a 20 pack there. Yeah. And lastly here, that's U for uranium, also no charge. Going to start here at the atomic number. Uh, number of protons in this case then would be 92. Equal number of electrons since it is neutral. And our number of neutrons in this case, mass number, which is 238 minus 92, uh, which is our atomic number. That feels like a lot, like a buck 46 maybe there, I think. Yeah. In that case, any questions on any of those there? All right, Let's try a few more here. So on these... Why don't you write the symbols with the uh, mass number and atomic number? And I think on the last one there as well, we're going to. Uh, so uh, periodic table, probably helpful here. Uh, so krypton, we want to go to our periodic table, find krypton, which is KR. And the important thing that we need for this is the number up on top, right, which is our atomic number in this case. And that means that we would start with our symbol. Uh, we would put our atomic number there on the bottom. Remember that our mass number, right, is our number of protons plus our number of neutrons. That is why the 36 is also important, right, because it tells us our number of protons. Uh, number of neutrons here is given to us. Again, we're not going to use the number on the periodic table for that, uh, for the mass number, which would be 48, and that's going to be an 84. Uh, so we should end up with something that looks like this. Yeah. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Next one is nitrogen. So once again, uh, N on the periodic table, we see seven, which is important. Uh, so we'll start with the N, we'll put our seven. Uh, that's also gonna help us with our mass number because now we know uh, we have uh, seven protons and our neutrons was given to us. Uh, so that's gonna be a 13. And that would go right there up on top. Once again, here, we could assume that all these are neutral as it didn't mention anything about charge or anything like that. So um, it's safe to assume that it is neutral in each of these cases. Lastly, it's iron. Uh, iron's after actually Fe, uh, which should be 26 right there. And in this case, they actually gave us the mass number. Uh, so that means our iron here will go 26 on the bottom for our atomic number. We'll take the mass number that they gave us, which would be 56, should go up on top. Now the number of protons here is going to be 26. Yeah. It is neutral. So our number of electrons should also be 26. And our number of neutrons in this case would be, once again, our mass number, which is 56 minus our atomic number, which is 26. And that's going to be 30 in this case. Yeah. Any questions on atomic number, mass number, 
protons, electrons, neutrons, isotopes, how to write them. Yeah. All right, so to answer the question that you're asking, what do we do if we do have a charge, right? So let's talk a little bit about what would happen if we did have something with a charge and how that would affect some things. So we'll just steal these two examples that we got here, I think, and uh, do is maybe erase this here. All right, so if we do have something with a charge, anything that has a charge on it uh, is known as an ion. So an ion is something that has a charge. And there's really two types of ions that we come across. There is everybody's favorite cations. And those are positively charged ions. And then there's everybody's second favorite ion, which is the anions, uh, which are negatively charged. So there's two types of ions in this case. So let's take a look and see what would happen in each of these cases if we did have, say, something with a charge. So. Let's say we take our nitrogen here and it ends up, maybe let's get rid of that too, there we go. We'll take our nitrogen and we'll pop in there a charge on it. We'll go with uh, minus three, which is what it makes. And we'll do the same numbers here. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things here. First thing is, we know that the number of protons here should be seven, right? Because the atomic number there is still seven, right? So we should have seven of them. We also know that if we subtract these two, uh, which is our mass number minus our atomic number, uh, that will give us our number of neutrons, which would be 13 minus seven, which would still be six. So clearly at this point, the process of elimination is... What thing affects the charge? It is electrons. We also know that it cannot be protons, which is the other thing that has a charge, because as we talked about previously, if I change the protons in this case, that is no longer going to be nitrogen, right? So it can never change the protons when something gets a charge. It is actually only the electrons that change the charge here. So let's see how the charge is changed from its neutral environment. Here again, um, this guy in his neutral state, it has uh, seven protons and it also has seven electrons, right? And it's neutral to give it no charge. Here, in this case, with a minus three charge, how many electrons does it have? It does have 10 negatively charged electrons, right? 10 negative things plus seven positive things leave you three negative things left over. And that is where the charge comes from, right? It's minus three. It's because it has, frankly, three more electrons than it started with, right? So it has more electrons than protons in this case. And that is why it has a minus three charge. So what we hopefully learn at this point is negatively charged things is a result of gaining electrons. And that is what you should think about when you see a negative charge is it actually gained electrons. The number is actually how many electrons it gained from the neutral atom, right? So it had, neutral guy had seven electrons. Guy with a minus three charge has 10 electrons. Difference between 10 and seven is three. So it gained three electrons from his neutral guy. Now, if we take something like iron over here, and we give iron a plus two charge, once again, if we took the difference between our mass number and atomic number, in this case, uh, we would still have 30, right, neutrons. We know, again, the atomic number here is 26, so the number of protons should be 26 in this case. So once again, even though it's a positive charge, it is the electrons that are different here. And in this case, how many electrons should it have? It should have 24 electrons, right? 26 positive things plus 24 negative things leave you like two positive things left over because it has two more protons than electrons in this case. And that is where the positive two charge comes from. So when you see a positive charge, 
it indicates a cation, and that means that somebody has lost some electrons, right? And the number is the same deal. It's how many electrons it lost from its neutral. In its neutral state, it had 26 electrons. With its plus two charge, it has 24 electrons. It lost two electrons from its neutral guy. So if you're not sure how to adjust the electrons appropriately, you could do this. You know if you have a negative charge, you should add electrons. And you could add the charge to the atomic number, right? Because the atomic number in a neutral atom should be the same number of electrons, right? So if you have a negative charge, you could add those to the atomic number. And I'll tell you how many electrons. And if you had a positive charge, you should subtract the charge from the atomic number. And I'll tell you how many electrons um, if you have trouble with that. So when something becomes an ion, it is only the electrons uh, that are involved in that situation. Uh, no protons, again, otherwise we would be changing the elements. So if I had something like That's something like uh, that's something like that, or maybe I have something like uh, for each of these, how many protons, electrons, and neutrons do we? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, first one is cobalt here, plus four charge. So we'll start with the easiest thing, right, which is our protons there. Uh, so we got uh, 27 protons. We could get our neutrons just as easy by taking the top number, right, minus the bottom, which is our mass number, minus our atomic number, which in this case would be 33. Now, it does have a plus four charge, which means plus means that it gained or lost electrons. I thought both answers, which one would be right there? It is lost electrons, right? And it lost how many electrons? Four, which means number of electrons I should have in this case is 23. 27 positives, 23 negatives, gonna give you a plus four left over. And again, that is where the charge comes from. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Coming on the bottom one, which is sulfur. We'll start with our protons, which is 16. This should match my Atomic number there. I will do our neutrons, which is our mass number minus our atomic number, uh, which would give you, thank you, it's too late for me to do it. <laughs> and uh, at this point, we do see a negative charge there, uh, which is going to mean it gained electrons, right? And the two means they actually gained two electrons. So really, you could just add that to your protons, right? And it should have. 18, right? And that gives us our minus two left over. Any questions on that there? All right, questions on uh, mass number, atomic number, protons, electrons, neutrons for neutral things, things with charges. Any questions on anything we've talked about so far? Everybody doing good? All right. So we're now going to actually talk about, uh, get through all this. There we go. Uh, a little bit uh, about isotopes here, as we've been talking about, uh, but just to kind of finish up on isotopes, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the properties of elements really do uh, come from uh, their protons and really what's in the nucleus. Um, and one of the benefits of isotopes are sort of practical applications of isotopes, uh, say in a research laboratory, for example, is a lot of elements do have radioactive versions of isotopes. And, um, you know, so if you're studying something, maybe something that has copper in it and proteins or something like that, uh, you can actually use a radioactive version of like copper. And that would allow you just by following the radioactivity, you figure out where the copper is at all times, kind of follow the copper through any type of pathway. And radioactive versions of isotopes or elements uh, basically do the same chemistry as non-radioactive versions of isotopes are elements. Um, so that's one of the sort of applications that a lot of uh, research sort of labs use is these radioactive isotopes of elements as sort of tracers. So you could follow what's happening with elements as it goes through certain pathways and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> 
So now we're going to talk about really chemical composition, and we're going to really focus on the number here on the bottom of the periodic table and sort of, you know, where that comes from and how we get to that sort of number. So atomic masses is, again, a fundamental property of atoms. They are obviously based on how many protons, electrons, and neutrons that the atom has. They are clearly extremely small. Uh, you can't really just pick one atom up and go, I'm just going to kind of put it on the balance there and weigh it out and see what the mass is. So in chemistry and in sciences, a lot of times when we cannot sort of directly measure something, uh, a lot of times what they will do is sort of assign something as like a standard to compare everybody to. And in the case of atomic masses, uh, which is sometimes referred to as atomic weights, they actually took a isotope of carbon, uh, the carbon-12 isotope, and used that as sort of the standard to compare everybody else to. The carbon-12 isotope um, has a mass of exactly 12 AMU, which is that atomic mass unit we were just talking about. And they did experiments, and for example, it showed that uh, hydrogen is about 8.4% as massive as the carbon-12 isotope. So to do a little quick little calculation, that is uh, 8.4 converted into a decimal, right? Divided by 100 or move the decimal place two places to the left, right? Or divided by 100, it'll do it for you. Uh, and we get 1.008, which is essentially what you see there on hydrogen when you look underneath the... Uh, periodic table. Similar calculations were done for everybody there on the periodic table, and you can find those lists there. So, for example, hydrogen 1.008, that again is what is known as the atomic mass. And really, if you were to pull that number off to use it, uh, most of the time we pull the number to four significant figures. So, uh, depending on your periodic table, you may have a lot more numbers on the bottom there or a little bit less numbers maybe. But the general rule is when you go to pull this number off the periodic table, which we will do in several chapters as well, uh, we usually pull off about four significant figures. Um, and that's typically how many numbers that you should take off when you do that. So for example, what this means for hydrogen is there's basically 1.008 AMU per atom. So that's sort of the units that you can get when you pull it off the periodic table. The number stays with the atomic mass unit and is per atom. Uh, similar calculations were done for oxygen and iron. Iron, again, is 55, as you see there, 85, which means for iron, there would be 55, 85 atomic mass units in an atom. Uh, sort of a conversion if you did need to use that as some type of conversion, basically. Uh, obviously, they're all listed here. And as we talked about previously, a good one more time reminder, not the mass number, right? So again, this is the atomic mass, which is different. So when we look at carbon, for example, carbon says 12.01. And you may say to yourself, well, if they use carbon as the standard, like the carbon 12 there, and it has a mass of 12 exactly, why does it say 12.01 when we look at carbon on the periodic table? And that is because what we really have here on the periodic table is actually the average atomic masses of these elements. And what that means is it is the average atomic mass of all the naturally occurring isotopes for that particular element. So something like carbon, there's the carbon 12 isotope and the carbon 13 isotope. And through a calculation, they end up with this as their atomic mass. Uh, and that's basically what we see on the periodic table for all the elements. Most people don't call it an average atomic mass, but it is basically made up of all the naturally occurring isotopes. So how do you calculate it in that case if you wanted to calculate the atomic mass and you knew you know, the mass of each of the isotopes, for example? You would use this sort of formula here. You could calculate the atomic mass by taking the percentage of the first isotope 
and that is usually what's sometimes referred to as the relative abundance. So the relative abundance in a percentage, you times it by the atomic mass of the first isotope. And this is where people always screw up. You add, not multiply, but add to the percentage of the second isotope for that particular element times the atomic mass of the second isotope. Then you add it to however many isotopes they have. So you just kind of continue that pattern. They have three naturally occurring isotopes. You would do it for the third one. Couple things mathematically when we do this, we do need to convert the percentage into a decimal before you multiply. So you could do that again, one of two ways. You could divide the percentage by 100 and it will move the decimal point for you. Or you could just move the decimal point two places to the left. But you do have to convert it out of the percentage into uh, a decimal before you throw it into this equation here. By the way, if I add up all my isotopes, my naturally occurring isotopes, and I add up all their percentages, it should add up to what percent? 100%, right? Our point, R1 if you did the points, but 100% as well. So if you come across a problem where you have some percentages given to you and they don't all add up to 100, that means you're missing something, uh, one of the isotopes, right? Because you don't should add up to 100. My guess is you'd have some type of information to allow you to figure out what the missing percentage is. Uh, but, you know, that's something to keep in mind. So using this type of calculation, uh, that's essentially how we get these numbers here on the periodic table. So let's take a look at one here. Um, if we do our carbon here, uh, that is the carbon 12 isotope, which is 12 AMU. It occurs about 99% of the time almost basically. The carbon 13 isotope has a mass of 13.003, occurs about 1% of the time. So again, if we were going to do our calculation, we would take our abundance or relative abundance or percent abundance here for our first isotope. And again, you can move the decimal point two places to the left, and that would be 0.9897. We would times it by the 12 AMU, which is the atomic mass of our first isotope. We would then convert this into a decimal, which if you don't want to move the decimal place, you could do this, take the percentage and divide it by 100% and then times it by the isotope's mass. And if you do all that, I hope it comes to that number we see there. Let's see, 0. 0.9897 times 12 plus, I get really 1202 on my calculator, but we'll call it 1201, I guess. All right, 1202, I'll go with what I got on my calculator uh, when you do that. <clears throat> and that obviously is pretty close to what we do see there for carbon on the periodic table. It's a little off because there's actually a lot more zeros on those numbers than what they put up there. Any question on that? <clears throat> so it is important to remember, for example, if you look at carbon and you're able to pick out the carbon atoms, uh, you would actually never find one that is 12.01. You would find one that's either the carbon 12 isotope, which would have a mass of 12, or you would find one that's a carbon 13 isotope that has a mass of 13 and change there. Uh, so again, it is just an average value that we use for calculations, uh, but you will never really find a carbon atom that actually has that exact mass. Yeah. Yeah, so it is the percentage of finding in nature. Um, not really uh, for our class in terms of how they kind of figure out those things, but they, they use something that's known as a mass spec. And what they do is they run a sample through it and they kind of heat it up a lot. And there's like a magnetic field and so forth and electrical field. And as it heats up and it goes through these magnetic fields and electrical fields, it'll eventually hit like a screen and it will actually separate out and they will come off these different uh, isotopes 
uh, at different points along the way uh, based on their, their mass. So they'll kind of separate out from their mass to different isotopes. And the actual peaks that will come off on these mass spec sort of graphs is how they figure out the percentages. Like, hey, this peak is, you know, about 50% of what's coming off. Yeah, so basically if you did carbon, for example, and you looked at the sort of graph there that would come off, if you did this, you would see almost like a giant peak for the carbon 12, which is about 99% of it. And then about a much smaller peak for the carbon 13 sort of peak that comes off. But that's actually the, the process of how they kind of come up with those percentages as they use something that's known as like a mass spec to sort of do that. Other questions, <clears throat> but the simple answer is correctly what you said. It's like ninety nine percent of the time in nature you're going to find that guy versus about one percent of the time you're going to find that. All right, so why don't you try one here? Let's do a little bromine action. Uh, bromine has two stable isotopes: uh, bromine seventy nine and bromine eighty one. Occurs about fifty percent and forty nine percent of the time. They have those uh, atomic masses. What is the average atomic mass of bromine here? Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, we got two isotopes here, uh, bromine 79, which again would be his mass number, right? And 81, which would be his mass number, not really important for this calculation. Obviously, again, the atomic number would be found up there on our periodic table. Uh, we do wanna check, as I mentioned before, we got our percentages, right? Just wanna kind of quickly take a look at them, make sure that they do add up to 100. I may not be exactly 100 right on the nose, but it should be pretty close. You know, maybe like 99 or a little bit over or something like that, but it should definitely be pretty close, uh, which in this case is pretty darn close, I think, to 100%. Uh, so we have our first uh, isotope, which is bromine 79. that occurs about 50.70% of the time and has a atomic mass of 78.92. We have our bromine 81, which occurs the rest there, about 49% or so, has a mass of 80.92 AMU. So once again, we're gonna use our formula here. So we're gonna take our atomic mass and we're gonna take the percentage of the first isotope. I'm just gonna move the decimal place over two places to the left. So that's gonna be 0.5070. Once again, you can divide it by 100 if you want it just to kind of do it for you. We're going to times it by the atomic mass of the first isotope there. So this is basically our bromine 79 information in there. We are going to once again add here, not multiply or subtract or anything like that. And we're going to do the same thing for our second isotope. And once again, if you don't want to move the decimal, you could do this move here where you divide it by 100% and then times it by 80.92 AMU. This would be our bromine 81 information. And now if we do all that good stuff there, 0 0.5070 times 78.92 plus 0 0.4932 times 80.92. Uh, that looks like a 79.92 AMU. And uh, looks like that one right there. It looks like, yeah. Any questions on that calculation? So again, uh, the atomic mass based on protons, electrons, and neutrons. It's also based on all the naturally occurring isotopes for those elements and using carbon-12 as our sort of standard isotope to compare everybody to. Any questions on that there? All right. <clears throat> All right, so then let's talk more about the periodic table, which is hanging right here. That's the periodic table, good talk. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the parts of the periodic table. First off, uh, the elements in a column on the periodic table, which is going up and down, uh, that is referred to as a group. <laughs> if you're old like me, a family, nobody calls it a family anymore. Most people call it groups these days. Uh, and when you look at the periodic table, like the one we got up here, for example, uh, there's some A numbering, there's some B numbering happening. We have it over here as well, some A numbering, some B numbering sort of happening. We use what is referred to as the representative numbering, uh, which is actually the A numbering is typically what we use. And when we use the A numbering, group one is right here, group two is right here. We actually skip the middle part. Group three is here, group four, group five, 
group six, group seven, and group eight. They are technically 1A, 2A, 3A, but most people don't call it A's. They just call it one, two, three, and so forth. On the big one here, this is group one. Actually starts with lithium, not hydrogen. We'll talk why that is in just a second, but it actually starts with lithium. Group two is here. We skip all this. Group three, group four, group five, group six, group seven, and group eight over there is the proper way to do the numbering. Um, horizontal rows uh, going basically left to right on the periodic table are periods on the periodic table. And there are seven periods. Uh, that's period one, as you can see, two, three, four, five, six, and seven heading again in this direction, as you can also see on this one here. One, two, and so forth, three coming that way. <clears throat> we also talked about obviously the number on top of the symbols, uh, as we should know again, is our atomic number, right? And our number of protons that we have in the periodic table or an atom of an element. The periodic table is really divided up into three different types of categories. Uh, there are metals, uh, there are non-metals, and there are metalloids, which are also sometimes called semi-metals. On most periodic tables, like you can see here, there's something that's sometimes referred to as like a stereo, usually kind of like a darker line coming down there. Uh, here it is on this one. To the left of that are metals. To the upper right of that sort of staircase are the non-metals. And right on that staircase, that's boron for reference. Uh, and some books will include boron as well. Uh, those are our metal voids coming through there. So metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. Uh, they can be hammered into sheets. Uh, they can be pulled into wires. They're typically shiny. Most metals are solids at room temperature. The one exception is mercury, which is usually a different color. Not on this periodic table, but usually it's a different color here. Uh, a lot of times they do it in blue. I saw one today where they made the box green. Uh, but uh, mercury is actually a liquid. Uh, and it's the only sort of metal that is actually a liquid. Um, the non-metals, which again are to the upper right here of the staircase, have pretty much the opposite sort of characteristics. They are bad conductors of heat and electricity. They're dull. They're brittle. They also have a much uh, wider variety of states. Some are gases, some are liquids, some are solids. A lot of non-metals are our diatomic uh, molecules that are elements, like our hydrogen, our nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodide. So these are all those diatomic molecules, which are also elements that we talked about, I think, in an earlier chapter. And they're also all non-metals. Um, that is why over here, that is hydrogen. Hydrogen is a metal or a non-metal. It is a non-metal, even though on every single periodic table you will ever see, it is hanging out with all these metals. And that is why hydrogen is not part of group one. It actually starts with lithium, which is a metal. I'm old enough to remember that they used to print hydrogen on this side and also that side of the periodic table. Uh, years ago, they actually put it on both sides of the periodic table. Nowadays, they typically just leave it over there. The reason for that, as we'll talk about as we go through several chapters is hydrogen has some unusual characteristics. Uh, and a lot of times, for example, in terms of bonding, uh, in terms of naming, we oftentimes kind of treat it like a metal in group one, like a group one sort of metal. So that's why it's over there, but it is technically a non-metal. So it is not part of group one, but you will find it on the periodic table. Uh, right there. Our metalloids, uh, which again, some books will include boron right there, like this one does here, um, kind of comes down the staircase as so. Uh, metalloids, which are also sometimes called semi-metals, and you can see by their location, uh, they kind of have metals to the left of them. They got non-metals to the right of them. So it would probably make sense to you that metalloids pretty much have properties that are both ways, yeah. So the same metalloid has several properties that are like metals, and the same element will have 
similar properties that are like non-metals. That's why there's sometimes semiconductors. Yeah, they kind of fall both sides of that uh, arena there. So metalloids is sort of like a transition point as you go from metals to non-metals. And those guys kind of have characteristics that fall on either side, a lot of them. Some other important parts of the periodic table. Uh, certain groups do have special names that you do need to know. So group one, which again is going to start with our lithium, is the alkali metals. Right next door is our group number two, which is the alkaline earth metals. Just for reference point, alkaline pretty much means basic. And that is where a lot of bases come from, like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, and so forth. So a lot of those metals in group one and group two that hook themselves up with some hydroxide is where a lot of our bases come from in chemistry. Uh, all the way over here at group seven, a lot of those diatomic guys are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are our halogens right there. As you can see right next door is going to be our noble gases. So let's talk about those. Right next door at group number eight is our noble gases. Noble gases are rare gases, which also people don't really call it that very much too much anymore. Most people call it noble gases. Noble gases are chemically inert, which means they do not react with other things. They're very unreactive. Most are monotomic, which means they come as one. So they're themselves, but really nothing else. Uh, <clears throat> the two rows at the, and by the way, noble means set apart, and that's what it sort of means. They're very unreactive. There's also noble metals, by the way. Uh, there's gold, silver, and platinum. They're also very unreactive metals. So those guys, gold, silver, and platinum are sometimes referred to as noble metals because they're not very reactive either. Uh, the two rows on the bottom of the periodic table, if you follow the numbering, uh, that's 57 and that's 72. Missing numbers right there, 58. And that's 89 and 104. Missing number is 90. These two rows right here technically should go right about there on the periodic table. And those are what are referred to as the lanthanide series and actinide series. These guys on the bottom should technically go right here. Most of the time they don't do that because then your periodic table gets quite wide. Only one place I've ever been, which I was there not too long ago. They have it on the wall and it takes the whole wall because it pushes the entire periodic table across the other way. Um, so those guys technically go there if you follow the atomic numbers, um, but they're usually on the bottom. Good news for us is we don't deal too much with these guys. A lot of these guys is where you find uh, radioactive elements, man-made elements, things like Einsteinium and Nobelium and all those kind of stuff are down in this way as well. The other really important thing happens between group number two, group number three on the periodic table. That is these guys right here. These are the transition metals. Transition metals, as we will talk about when we get into naming, uh, one of the characteristics of transition metals are uh, they oftentimes can make a variable type of positive charge. So for example, copper in some cases could be plus one, other cases could be plus two. Iron could be like plus three and plus two. So unlike uh, metals that are like in group one and two and three, they have more fixed charges, which no matter what the situation is, they're always going to form, you know, a fixed charge. But these guys in the transition metal region have the ability in certain cases to form different types of positive charges, depending on who they are hooked up with. Any questions on that? <clears throat> as also why these two rows on the bottom are sometimes also referred to as inner transition metals because technically that's kind of where they should go kind of in the middle there of those two guys as well <clears throat> all right any questions on the periodic table so you need to know obviously which way groups go which way periods go uh the proper numbering the one two skip the middle three four five six seven eight you need to know where the alkali metals are alkaline earth metal the halogens and the noble gases are located 
You also obviously need to know where the transition metals are located. You know some characteristics of metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, they don't react with other elements usually. Uh, you know, they're, they do react, they can react with other noble gases in a sense, uh, but they really don't usually react with, they're pretty unreactive. It's kind of like uh, gold, for example, which is a noble uh, metal. Uh, you can throw a lot of stuff at gold and not much is going to happen to it. It's very unreactive. Uh, even if you dump like nitric acid on it or anything like that, it's not going to do much to it. So um, the reason for that is some of the things that we'll talk about uh, as we go through different chapters. One of the main things that everybody else on the periodic table tries to do is through bonding, for example, everybody else on the periodic table tries to end up exactly like the noble gases in terms of their electron configuration. And that's why they're very stable and unreactive because frankly, they're quite happy the way they started at. Everybody else is not very happy. And that's why other things will do ionic bonding, covalent bonding to try to get themselves to not become these guys, but become very similar to them in terms of their electrons. And the reason that they're very unreactive is because they're like full and good to go already. They don't need to do anything. That's what, yeah, in terms of electrons, and they're, they're really full in a sense, and they don't really want to react. And that's why they're very unreactive because of that. Yeah. That's why when we talk about reactivity, for example, <clears throat> the most reactive non-metal is actually right here. And that's because it's right before these guys, because these guys aren't going to do much because they're good. Uh, but this is the most reactive non-metal. And the most reactive metal is actually way over here on this corner of the periodic table. Uh, and, and that's, again, everybody. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. Speaking of electrons, let's talk a little bit about uh, atomic theory. Not a lot, but we're going to really talk about for the rest here about electrons and how electrons are in the atom and where they are in the atom. And we're gonna talk about uh, electron configuration. And at the very end, we'll talk about periodic trends, which we'll talk about why things are reactive and sort of not reactive. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about here in this chapter involves electrons. And just in general, when we have electrons in an atom, they are on different energy level, different electrons, for example. And let's just say that these are energy levels here. And let's just say we had an electron, say, on a lower energy level, and we do something to it to excite it. And what happens, let's just say we set it on fire. Might excite it, I suppose, right? We run some electrical current through it. Might excite it as well. All those things are really giving this electron more energy. And what's going to happen is this electron is going to absorb energy, basically. And that's going to cause this electron to find itself, for example up at a higher energy level as it gained all that electrons or that all that energy. Electrons are no different than us. We usually like to be in a high state of energy or a low state of energy. Most of us like to like take a nap and relax. Yeah? So we all like to be in a low state of energy. So what happens when electrons, for example, get excited like this is at some point, they're gonna work themselves back down to a lower state of energy. So they're going to kind of try to work their way back down, maybe where they started, maybe before they get back down to where they started, but to a lower state of energy. And one idea that we talked about was this idea of the law of conservation of energy, which means we don't lose energy, create energy. So that energy has to go somewhere as they come back down. Would the atom have to give off that energy or absorb more energy if they wanted to go back down? It has to give off the energy. So as this electron is coming down, that energy is going to be given off uh, from the atom in the form of a photon of light, which is really a wave. Right. And when we talk about wave, waves have several functions, but waves have what is sometimes referred to as lambda, which is the wavelength. And when we talk about waves, 
if we have something that has a really long wavelength like this, this also has a lower frequency, which means it doesn't occur as often, right? Because it's kind of slowly moving through space, right? And it also will have a lower energy. So a longer wavelength will have a lower energy and a lower frequency, as opposed to a much smaller wavelength, which would be like this wavelength. So a much smaller wavelength, we could see that this wave occurs a lot more frequent, has a much higher frequency. And that results in a higher energy. So the wavelength of this sort of energy that comes off as a wave, as the atom is losing this energy, as the electron, for example, is coming back off, the wavelength of that has a big effect on what you might witness. Now, one of the uh, real life examples of this sort of happening is 4th of July, right? We launch fireworks. And what do we see in the sky? We see, we see colors, right? When they go off, right? Hopefully, uh, and a lot of smoke, but we see the colors. What is fireworks? So fireworks, uh, they shoot them off, they explode, right? They have, uh, you know, sort of an explosion which provides a lot of energy to the elements inside the fireworks. All the electrons in those elements get up to a higher energy level, come back down to a lower energy level. As they're doing that, they're emitting all this energy in the form of light that we could see. And that is part of what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum. And the part of the spectrum that we could see is this part right here. That is the visible part of the spectrum where we see color, like that Roy G. Bibb, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, different colors. And we actually will see uh, the different colors that come off as a result of these electrons sort of transitioning down. If you've ever done a flame test, right? You put it in the flame, you see color comes off. You might have done a flame test. Perhaps you're a good cook like everybody and you boiled water to make some pasta. Maybe it overboiled and maybe you have a, a gas stove, right? And you got a flame, water hits the flame, the flame color changes yeah it kind of goes orangey or yellowy that's like the sodium getting excited as it hits the flame and you're seeing the color that's happening so see you did a flame test at home making pasta you didn't know that there you go good for valentine's day right go home make some pasta don't do too much of a flame test i suppose and set the place on fire um but not all transition of electrons as they give off this energy uh will result in us seeing something so there's different parts of electromagnetic spectrum uh, there's like radio waves, like when we listen to the radio, right? Uh, that has a certain amount of energy. It's not too bad. When you put your dial to a specific radio station, like 95.5, 102.7, that is megahertz, which is a frequency. Yeah. And it has a specific wavelength that is coming in at that. When you cook your food in the microwave, it has enough energy to spin the water molecules in your food really fast so you get your pizza in three minutes which might be a good idea tonight as well uh, in case you need to make that but there's different parts to the electromagnetic spectrum there's the infrared where we feel heat there's also things like the ultraviolet region right which is why we put sunblock on very high energy right so we don't get too burnt because that's very strong there's x-rays which is at this end over here wherever it is Actually, it's on this end. X-rays over here, which is very short wavelengths. That's why they throw a lead vest on you and leave the room when they shoot the X-rays, right? <laughs> and there's gamma rays that we've been talking about, which is just pure energy as well, which is why you have to wear a lot of protection if you're working with something like that. So what we're going to talk about here in the rest of this chapter is a little bit about how electrons transition. They give off energy as they do so. They have to absorb energy as they go up to a higher energy level. They have to release that energy out as they drop back down to a lower energy. And that energy comes off in the form of a photon of light that has a specific wavelength that may fall somewhere here on the electromagnetic spectrum.